everyone. I want to give you a short lecture over your signature assignment for 1302. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let's talk a little bit about this. So for your signature assignment, you're reading two primary sources. One is an excerpt from Wealth, which was written by Andrew Carnegie in 1889. Um, remember who Andrew Carnegie is. He's one of the depending on your point of view, robber baron or captain of industry in the Gilded Age. He came to the United States as an immigrant and he, you know, he wasn't really the poorest of the poor. He was more kind of lower middle class, but um, he worked as, he became the owner of U.S. Steel and, and became one of the richest men in the world. So he's kind of the celebrated weird rags to riches story, right, in the Gilded Age that everyone likes to point to. Remember, he's the exception, not the norm. Most people this didn't happen to. So there's him. And then the slow progress of the boy who starts in a breaker and ends an old man in the breaker, as told by a man who was once a minor by the Reverend John McDowell, which is from 1902. So you're going to be reading these two works and then kind of comparing and contrasting them. Remember that for anything you're turning in for me, you need to be citing these documents to make your case. And those citations should be Turabian footnotes. So make sure that you figure out how to do that properly before you do your paper. And of course, review the rubric um, before you submit anything. So let's start talking about wealth by Carnegie. So Carnegie starts off by saying, the problem of our age is the proper administration of wealth so that the ties of brotherhood may still bind together the rich and poor in harmonious relationship. So immediately, He's telling you that the issue of their day is inequality. This is what this whole thing is about, wealth and equality. And the fact that he's talking about um, may still bind together rich and poor and harmonious relationship indicates that there's tension between these two groups about what's going on with the quote, proper administration of wealth, the, the rich kind of having all their money and what they're spending it on. So there's class issues going on here and there's inequality issues going on here in the guild age. And keep in mind who Carnegie is. Carnegie is the richest of the rich, right? So the current system as it exists greatly benefits Andrew Carnegie. It's going to be highly unlikely that he wants to change any of it because he's got a gazillion dollars, right? The current system is very good to him. So keep that in mind as you read this. So he goes in and he talks about, the first thing he does is he talks about um, the Indians are today where civilized man was then. And in this, he was basically saying that in the past, um, the difference, the material difference between somebody who was rich and somebody who was very poor was much more limited. Um, that's not to say that there weren't differences, but they weren't quite as pronounced. And Native Americans to him are the example where the chief, his house and his dwelling and his possessions weren't that much better or different than just kind of anybody else in the tribe. And so, but pay attention to what he's kind of implying here, right? Um, where civilized man was then. In other words, Indians, because they have this situation, are in fact not civilized. So kind of pay attention to the race, the inherent racism in here. It's not at the forefront of his mind when he's talking about this, but you can see that his worldview is, is very much steeped in racism and it's just kind of implied throughout this document. And then he says, the contrast between the palace of the millionaire and the cottage of the laborer with us today measures the change which has come with civilization. So the fact that the rich live in very, very nice mansions and the poor may live in a one room tenement with inadequate plumbing for 10 people, um, he's saying that that is civilization, okay? And so keep in mind then that if that's how he's defining civilization, look who's left out, right, inherently. And so this change in material situation and this change in any and this great inequality he argues is not to be deplored but welcomed as highly beneficial it is well nay essential for the progress of the race 
that the houses of some should be homes for all that is highest and best in literature and arts. Without wealth, there can be no nascence. So this inequality, this great inequality, is a good thing, according to Carnegie. And he says not only is it something you shouldn't complain about, you should be welcoming it for the progress of the race. Now, when he uses this term, undeniably or undoubtedly in the back of his head, he's picturing a white male, right? But he's not using this term with that idea in the forefront of his mind. He's using it more in place of like American civilization. But again, remember that term is highly loaded, right? Because who is he thinking of and who is he leaving out whenever he says civilization? And if he's leaving out Native Americans, He's probably leaving out African Americans. He's probably leaving out Hispanics and Asian Americans and everybody else too, right? So just kind of pay attention to that. So essentially he's saying that this inequality is good for civilization. It's good for the whole. Maybe it's not good for the individual, but for the whole it is. And because it's because of this inequality that we have, you know, the arts and that we have literature and that we have refinements. And that without that, you wouldn't have that. It would just be universal squalor, right? Everybody kind of living in filth. You can buy that or not, but don't let it, don't treat it uncritically. Is, is he implying that Native Americans didn't have art? Because that seems to be what he's saying here. And is that true? And then he says, in the past, neither master nor servant was as well situated then as today. In other words, because we have more material goods today, and because they had more material goods in the Gilded Age, this was better for everyone, right? It's better for the master, it's better for the servant, it's good for the rich, and it's good for the poor. Um, and so in Carnegie's mind, this kind of makes up for the inequality that we see. And he goes on to say, it is a waste of time to criticize the inevitable. In other words, these market forces, um, the way that the economy is being organized is inevitable, it's unchangeable. So you might as well quit complaining about it because you know it is what it is. Now this, you need to push back on. This was not inevitable. <laughs> this was a choice that was made in the Gilded Age and, and very much with us today and very much a break from the kind of economic structures that had existed in world history up until this point. Um, and we could talk about, you know, arguments of what the Knights of Labor called wage slavery, for example, this idea where you're divorced from the product that you produce and instead um, that's appropriated by the owners and you're being kind of paid a, a wage, which is something and a wage based on supply and demand of the workforce, right? This is something drastically different from what you would have seen in say medieval times in Europe, right? In medieval times in Europe, you would have been paid, you know, the common, the common rate. And that would have been what was enough to sustain a family doing that kind of work. It wasn't necessarily um, based on these kinds of market forces the way it was. So the fact that he's saying that this is inevitable is untrue. Keep this in mind. Other societies did this differently. Japan is a good example. Sweden is another example, right? Um, so push back on this. Make sure you realize that that's not entirely true. But these are the choices that were made in the United States. Now he says, it is easy to see how the change has come. One illustration will serve for almost every phase of the cause and the manufacture of products. We have the whole story. In other words, the fact that we're mass producing products um, is what has allowed this big jump in civilization, according to Carnegie, to take place. And so this is where we're talking about the mass production and the factories and, and that kind of thing. And so again, we kind of see this argument and you see this again and again in the Gilded Age all the way up to the present day, this idea in America that essentially if you can shop, you're free, right? We tend to um, see this argument made again and again, the definition of American freedom is the ability to consume, consumerism, how many, you have a lot of shoes, so you must be free. Um, so keep in mind that 
That's not the only way you can define freedom. And a lot of people reject that definition of freedom. But this is a very common one that you see even in the present day being made. And so then he says there was substantial, there was substantially social inequality and even political equality for those engaged in industrial pursuits had then little or no political voice in the state. But the inevitable result of such a mode of manufacture was crude articles at high prices. So before this, he's saying that there was social inequality and perhaps even more political equality than there was before, right? Um, but because of that, you, you, had, you didn't have all the good things that you can buy now. And so for him, um, this was not a good trade-off, right? But he does acknowledge that this was the trade-off. And then he goes on to say the poor enjoy what the rich could not before afford. In other words, the fact that the poor can now have, you know, 10 pairs of shoes, whereas before the rich maybe only had two, this means everybody's better off because we have more material possessions. Again, I leave that up to you to decide whether or not this is the best way to be defining freedom, right? Because do the poor have as much autonomy, control over their lives? In other words, could you leave today and quit your job um, because the working conditions were bad and not lose your home and your health insurance and your car? And if the answer to that is no, um, then are you free? And so these are things to kind of think about that there are other things you should be measuring freedom from. If you get sick, would you be able to stay home and recover for as long as you needed to and, and be okay um, socially and, and economically? And if the answer is no, are you free? Um, can you afford to have a child and, and, and have that child be taken care of while you work? And if the answer is no, are you free? So there's a lot of different ways that, or even going into a political realm, um, how much is your voice really affecting policy? If you have an idea about, uh, we'll take gun control, for example, universal background checks. I believe last time I saw the last poll I saw, it was like 80% of people wanted it. A very, very powerful interest groups such as the National Rifle Association don't. And so we don't have universal background checks. So who, what's the difference here? And the difference comes down again to money. So are we really, really free if our voices doesn't count as much because we don't have as much money? So keep that in mind. This is the way that Carnegie wants to define freedom. And you can buy into it if you want to but it's certainly not the only way that freedom can be defined and is defined. And then he says, he acknowledges that the price we, change, that we pay for the salutary change is no doubt great. And he kind of talks about this, right? But the advantage of this is also greater still, right? That it's better that we have these comforts and these luxuries and, and that's worth giving up all this other stuff that we had to give up to get it. And he argues that, and while the law may be sometimes hard for the individual, it is best for the race because it ensures the survival of the fittest in every department. And so here, your social Darwinism bells should be going off full blast, right? So Carnegie and almost all the super rich of his time were believers in social Darwinism. This idea that, um, that the rich were rich because they were somehow superior, right? They were stronger, faster, smarter, had better hair, whatever it was. And that the poor were poor for one of two reasons. Either they were inferior, right? You can't fix stupid. Or um, because they were lazy, that they just weren't applying themselves or working hard, right? And that's where you get into kind of this myth of hard work, that all you have to do in America is work hard to succeed. And don't get me wrong, I'm absolutely not saying that hard work isn't a part of success. It, it usually is, but not always. I mean, Donald Trump inherited $450 million. What did he do to earn that besides being born in the right womb, right? Not much. And then how many of you, your parents work very hard every day, and how many of them have $450 million? 
So you can see here that there's a very big disconnect between those ideas, right? And so um, keep in mind that it's very convenient to believe in social Darwinism when you're very, very rich, right? Because it basically allows you to dismiss anybody else who is who hasn't had the opportunities you have or who are in a situation where they cannot um, become rich or become successful, you can dismiss it as a personal problem. It's them, right? It's they're not working hard enough, as opposed to acknowledging that it may be an, a structural issue, right? That the economy is structured in such a way that it allows some people to become very, very rich through, through little or no effort and keeps other people very, very poor. And a good example of this is, you know, McDonald's. Um, if I were to tell you, hey, I'm 40 years old and I work at McDonald's, you immediately, whether you want to admit it or not, start making judgments. Oh, you didn't go to school. Oh, you must have screwed up. Oh, you're pretty lazy, right? But look, I worked fast food. Never worked harder in my life than for minimum wage. Oh my God, right? What I do now is much easier and I get paid much more. And we can all agree that that's an important job. We all get hungry. We all want a burger and we all want the guy flipping that burger to be good at what he does and not somebody nasty, right? So why is it then that the guy who flips the burgers at McDonald's has to be poor, right? This wasn't God. This wasn't God coming down and saying, wait, Mo, wait, 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 Moses, Moses, I got one more. Um, number 11, ye burger flippers shall live in poverty. Write that down. It'll make sense later. Not what happened. What happened was we said as a society that it is okay to exploit these workers, to let them work 40 hours a week and still not be able to afford a one bedroom apartment in the United States. That's a structural issue, not an individual issue. That individual is working and at a job that we need done, right? But structurally, we have said it's okay to exploit these workers. So, that is a social dar and you know society kind of lets it go because we have this social darwinism really firmly implanted in our head even unconsciously right and so you see that here where it comes from it comes from a hundred years ago these ideas being populated by the carnegies of the world and they found their way into textbooks into pop culture and, and into ordinary discourse and it's trickled all the way up to you when if you just kind of stop and think and parse through it you see it doesn't hold a lot of water once you start to kind of pick through it a little bit. So um, he's making the case for survival of the fittest, that you know the best should be allowed to prosper and the not so best should meh, kind of, if you die off, I guess it's your fault, right? We welcome or we accept and welcome therefore as conditions to which we must accommodate ourselves, great inequality of environment the concentration of business, industrial and commercial, in the hands of a few, and the law of competition between these as being not only beneficial, but essential for the future progress of the race. And again, we all talked about what this means, right? So here he is arguing for inequality of environment. It's fine if I live in a mansion and you live on a polluted, in a polluted tenement, that's fine, right? And the concentration of business. It's okay if you can't compete with Walmart, if you're, um, we're not going to file antitrust suits against them, that monopolies are good. And he's arguing that this is, is going to be beneficial for civilization, even though, as we know, monopolies are typically very bad for competition, typically very bad for consumers, okay? And then he says that it's okay for these very rich people to have all this money because this talent for organization and management is rare among men, and he does mean men, right, specifically white men, is proved by the fact that invariably secures for its possessor enormous rewards, no matter where or under what laws or conditions. So again, he's kind of making this argument without any evidence, by the way, there's some data to support this, that if you're just talented, no matter where you find yourself, you're going to rise and be rich and successful. Um, so I'll let you kind of think about that. Think about people in your own life um, who are smart and who are talented, um, but perhaps are not rich. 
that doesn't seem to jive with what he's saying here, right? And then, of course, um, he goes down to kind of attack anybody who is against this current system. And he says, the socialist or anarchist who seeks to overturn present conditions is to be regarded as attacking the foundation upon which civilization itself rests. Surely this sounds a little bit familiar because of modern day politics, right? That anybody basically seeking to overturn the status quo, and remember the status quo benefits some and disadvantages others, that's how it's set up, is automatically a socialist or in some cases anarchist. Today you could kind of substitute Antifa for anarchist, right? And that would take care of that. Um, so these attacks, on people who are calling for greater economic equality, greater economic and social justice are very, very old. And this is nothing new and this is how um, conservatives have attacked liberals throughout modern American history. And then he goes on to say, if thou dost not sow, thou shalt not reap, and thus ended primitive communism by separating the drones from the bees. In other words, he's talking about the people who are poor, it's because you're not working, right? And this is why communism didn't work. Um, there's a lot of issues with that. But as you'll see in the next document, these poor people are working and they're not benefiting, okay? And you don't necessarily have to go all the way to communism to see a system that's not necessarily benefiting everyone. But for Carnegie, and for conservatives all the way up into the present day, the, the thing that they're most concerned about is the sacredness. Notice this is a word we usually use for like holy things like, you know, church, right? Or the mosque or the, the temple. The sacredness of property. And so this is all about, um, to put it crudely, I made mine and I get to keep it, right? Um, so this for them is the bottom line. And then he says, we start then with a condition of affairs under which the best interests of the race are promoted, but which inevitably, inevitably gives wealth to the few. Thus far, accepting conditions as they exist, the situation can be surveyed and pronounced good. Okay, so he's saying, this is where we're at. Inequality is there, and we're all agreeing that this is good, right? He's just proclaiming it. We're all, we're all fine with this. This is good. And it's good because we all have, we can shop now. So we're all free. And even if it doesn't help the individual, it's helping us become civilized, right? And we're helping the fit survive and the unfit to uh, do whatever they do. Okay. And then, so since he's pronounced it good, the question he then asks is, um, with which we have to deal what is the proper mode of administering wealth after the laws upon which civilization has, is founded have thrown it into the hands of a few? So now that we have like two guys with all the money, what should those two guys be doing with it, right? And so this is where he talks about charity. And he was a big philanthropist, but not the kind of philanthropist where he's, you know, trying to provide health care and, and affordable housing and child care to people. He says, in bestowing charity, the main consideration should be to help those who will help themselves, those worthy of assistance, right? And so he's here doing a very American thing where we distinguish between what we call the, quote, deserving poor and the, quote, undeserving poor. It's why we put so many rules on, say, food stamps, like there isn't a lot of food in this country but we're going to decide who's worthy of getting help to eat and who is not worthy of getting help to eat. And you'll be shocked to know that there's oftentimes a lot of racial stuff um, embedded in those assumptions. But he's basically making the case that you don't want to give out charity in the sense of like soup kitchens or, you know, a free place to live or free education or stuff like that um, because you're helping the unworthy. The worthy, the, the people that would, quote, rise, the social Darwinistic superior folk, seldom require assistance anyway, okay? But if you're gonna give help, the way you should give help is um, the stuff that would allow the fit, that would allow the worthy to rise, not the stuff that would help the unfit kind of remain lazy, quote, unquote. So 
On the, the parks, you should be building parks by means of recreation, by which men are helped in body and mind. Works of art, certain to give pleasure and improve the public taste. And public institutions of various kinds, which will improve the general condition of people. And so Carnegie is a good example of this. He built libraries all across the country, the Carnegie libraries. And that was a great thing, right? But you have to ask yourself, especially when we get down and start talking about, you know, the, the kid who's a minor, after your 10 hour shift in the coal mine, do you really feel like going to the Carnegie Library and studying up on your algebra, right? But this is the kind of institution and the kind of charity that he's promoting, the kind that will allow the quote unquote fit to rise and would not allow the quote unfit to be lazy. And again, He's promoting this idea of kind of extreme individualism that's really unique and weird to America. Um, individualism will continue, but the millionaire will be the trustee for the poor, um, administering it for the community far better than it could or would have done for itself. So here he's making the claim, and it's a very anti-democratic claim, that the rich guy should decide how best to benefit the public with, with money um, if he chooses so right there should be no law requiring this and so this is very problematic right because a very good argument could be made that better public policy could be made you know through taxation and there's historians who have made this case that well you know rather than your pet project of building libraries uh, maybe we could have um, provided universal preschools right maybe that would have been something better for our community. But because you decided that you should be the trustee for the poor, as opposed to turning over this money to um, the public in order to, to promote the public good, you've kind of made this anti-democratic decision because it's one person making the decision as opposed to all of us in the form of a democracy. So you don't have to buy that argument, but understand that there's a competing argument to him saying that the best will come from the individual millionaire deciding best how to help the poor as opposed to the public um, deciding this as a, as a society. Okay, and so then we move into the contrast to Carnegie, the, the slow progress of the breaker boy. And so McDowell starts out by talking about the, the boy who's going to work in the mine. He's, he's only nine, maybe. Um, he's not supposed to be that young, but they often are because they're poor, they, their families are so poor and the pay is so bad. So the opportunities are very limited. And, you know, it's not like one or two kids, right? This is a lot of people. And that, you know, his day starts at 5.30 in the morning and he's going to put in a 10-hour day in a coal mine, right, for 50 to 70 cents for 10 hours work. So this isn't for hour, this is for the entire 10 hour day. And so you have to ask yourself realistically thinking through this, right? You're starting work in a mine at nine. How well do you read, right? And if you've ever had to work a 10 hour shift at your job, how much energy do you have at the end of that? And what if you're doing that for six days a week, because that was kind of the norm, um, six days a Monday through Saturday, and, and sometimes you would get Sundays off, sometimes you'd get half a day on Sundays, right? So how much time realistically do you have to go pursue other things, right? And then he talks about the fact that, you know, these kids from the very beginning, the air he breathes is saturated with coal dust. So this is telling you that here's some environmental inequality that's going on here because um, this is going to eventually cause what's called black lung disease. It's going to kill them, give them cancer at a very early age and give them breathing problems and health problems. So already at nine, um, he's setting himself up to be sick in a way that say Carnegie wasn't, that Carnegie's kids aren't. And how, much economic opportunity can you achieve if you can't breathe by the time you're 30? And are you free if this is your life already? These are questions you have to ask. He later goes on to become a door boy, never over 14 years of age and often younger. So we can see again, um, 
not much room for social advancement. He's alone all day in darkness and silence in the mine. Not many of these boys care to read, probably because they don't read very well, right? If you if you went into the mine at nine, right? That's what third grade, fourth grade, you know, that's about your reading level. Um, but even if they wanted to read, they probably can't. It's too dark. And so their wages vary, but still very, very low. And remember, from all these wages, he has to provide his own lamp, his own cotton, and his own oil. So they're deducting your wages, your already very, very low wages, which explains why um, these workers are working such long hours and, and taking home very, very little. And then eventually he works his way up to, to um, working with the mules. These boys are in constant danger. Um, and their pay again very low and they still have to provide their own stuff and maybe eventually um, he can become a minor proper right and for this um, he enters into a contract with the company to do a certain work at so much per car or per yard so if you aren't working it's based on your production so say you are supposed to fill five cars that day for your very low pay and you only fill four while well, your pay is getting deducted. And there's no such thing as sick time. There's no such thing as vacation. There's no such thing as, you know, um, paid time off or workers comp, right? If you get hurt, you just get hurt. None of that exists here, okay? And so then he says, the miner furnishes his own tools and supplies, his powder, swibs, paper, soap, and oil. He is compelled to buy from the company which employs him. And his equipment includes the following. So all these he has to provide for himself. And he almost always has to buy it from the company store. And so the company store, um, they almost always mark this up. So there's a great song by a guy named Tennessee Williams. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and go to YouTube so you guys can see it. Um, but he talks about this. It's called 16 Tons. And note how he talks about um, kind of how hopeless his life is, right? Some people say a man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bone. A mind that's a weak and a back that's strong. You load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day old and deeper than death. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store.
sometimes these companies would require you to buy their supplies, your supplies from them, but they would mark them up so high that you would fall into debt to the company so that basically all your wages are going to pay these debt that you're kept in poverty and you can't leave, right? Because you're so far in debt. And then at the end of the song, he's kind of alluding to the labor troubles that we'll see where there's these violent strikes that the government in almost always sides with the side of management and will come down and you know send in federal troops, send in police and and attack the strikers who are kind of, you know, fighting back against these conditions, which they see as unfair. So this wasn't something that happened, you know, just to one or two people. I mean, there's songs about it, right? This was how it was. And again, in the modern era, we do similar things. We just kind of frame it different ways. Again, Walmart or working in McDonald's is a good example. Um, you're, you're going to work there for 40 hours, but you're not going to be able to survive. So again, continue on. His dangers are many. So dangerous, in fact, he can't even get ordinary life insurance and that you'll just find crippled boys and broken down men. And remember, there's no social safety net yet. So these guys are on their own, the boys and the men. They better hope that they have family that can take care of them. But if their families were in a good position to help them, they wouldn't have been sending little boys into the mine anyway, right? And the average age of those killed is 32. That's pretty young to be killed on the job. And so McDowell argues that this is a sort of voluntary life imprisonment that very few escape, kind of the antithesis of freedom, which is what Carnegie says you have because you can shop, right? So they're coming from very different places and they're providing very different stories and very different outlooks on the Gilded Age, the economy of the Gilded Age, inequality and how things are. And so it's what you want to compare and contrast when you get to the question. You want to talk about Carnegie's views about wealth and equality, what he's saying, and compare that with the reality of the average coal miner. And remember, what impact does Carnegie's background have on his views? So things about you know him being that rags to riches example, but then also you know him being super rich, right? And and how have his views influenced the United States both in the Gilded Age and in the present? And so in the Gilded Age, you see this, but you see these views trickled on up, right? And so based on everything you know, is are Carnegie's views ethical? Why or why not? So I hope this helps you a little bit with the signature assignment. Good luck. Let me know if you have any questions.